Good morning, King's House. How's everybody doing on this cold and icy and gross Sunday morning? I am so sorry that we couldn't be together in person today. I don't know about anybody else, but this has given me like bad flashbacks of being in quarantine. And I do not do well in quarantine. I was iced in for several days this week, couldn't get out of my house. And uh, so anyways, you'll be happy to know that, that I've been passing the time. Uh, I bought Fast Snake a blow dart gun for Christmas. So we have set out bird seed right outside of one of our windows. Uh, we are shooting at birds with a blow dart gun. Uh, we're taking long walks in the eye, seeing how far we can slide, just doing the normal things that the hens do to help pass the time today. But anyways, we're on part two of this series called Fan or Follower. Here sitting on the table with me is a book with an incredibly handsome British fellow on it. His name is Martin Smith, and he's the lead singer for a band named Delirious. So imagine what a 13-year-old girl would have been to Justin Bieber a few years ago. Well, that's what I was to Martin Smith for years of my life. In my opinion, this guy is the greatest uh, worship leader, songwriter, um, musician of my generation. He, the, he and Delirious influenced uh, modern worship in just an incredible way. So if Martin Smith and Delirious were anywhere within like seven or eight hours, I want you to know Mark Hennon was there hours early on the front row. Uh, I'm embarrassed to tell you today that I had my wall covered in posters of Delirious and Martin Smith. I had signed CDs. In this book, I have a set list from one of his concerts that I stole. I snuck up on the stage and took his set list after one of his concerts. To say that I was a fan of Martin Smith uh, in an embarrassing way uh, is, is an understatement. I'll never forget the first time I met Martin Smith. I went to a concert at ORU at the Maybe Center and I was there hours early and Martin was outside with his kids playing Frisbee. I finally got up the nerve to approach Martin Smith and say, hey Martin, can I, can I just get a quick picture with you? He said no. Uh, it, it, it hurt my hurt my heart that day, but it, it didn't it didn't devastate me to the point of giving up because I continued to follow Martin Smith and, and Delirious. And a few years after that, I was at a concert in Oklahoma City. And before the concert, I saw all these VIP guests uh, going behind this black curtain. I didn't know what they were doing. I assumed they were meeting with the band. So even though I was definitely not a VIP guest, I thought the worst they could do is tell me no. So uh, I just strolled behind that black curtain like I like I own the place, like I belong there. And sure enough, they believed that I was a VIP guest. And, and Martin Smith and the other four band members are going around from person to person. And they're just uh, spending a few minutes talking with people and shaking hands. And uh, I was beyond nervous as Martin Smith approached. Uh, my, my belly was just full of butterflies. My hands were dripping wet. My mind was racing with countless questions that I wanted to ask my hero about worship, about songwriting, about, I mean, just, I'm trying to come up with something so sophisticated and important sounding. And, and here comes Martin Smith and he walks right in front of me and I reach out my hand and, and he shakes my hand and I have all these questions I want to ask him and absolutely nothing will come out. I mean, I just completely, totally, epically choked in that moment. I had dreamt of that moment for years. I'm in the moment and I just absolutely choke. Martin stands there, stares at me awkwardly for a few minutes. I finally mumble something about, I think you're great, glad to be here. I, I, it, long story short, I, I completely failed in that moment. I knew all about Martin Smith. Uh, it sounds super creepy, but I knew his kids' names. I knew his wife's name. I knew how they met. I knew where they lived. There was nothing about Martin Smith or Delirious that I didn't know. But I didn't know Martin Smith, obviously. And given the opportunity to get to, get to know him on some level, I just completely botched, which still hurts my heart today. But that's the question I want to ask you this morning, King's House, in regards to God. Do you know him? It's one thing to know about somebody, but do you actually know Jesus? 
in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, we see this word know, or we see this word knew, and, and listen to it in this context. It says, now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain. In the New Living Version, it says Adam lay with his wife Eve. So uh, there's, there's other words in the Hebrew language in the Old Testament that refers to making babies. I mean, there is for, for reproduction and, and sexual relationship. There's other words. But this word know or knew is, is unique. It's the word yada. And this word know means to know personally, to know experientially, and to know intimately. You see this same word in Psalms 139 all through the chapter. I want to read through you uh, verse 1 through 4. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit, when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. God knows you today in a personal experiential and wants to know you in an intimate kind of way. I, I think it's so incredible that we are fully known by God. There is no secrets that you have from Him. You are fully known. All your mistakes, your failures, your sins, your thoughts, you're fully known. And yet you are fully loved by God. And in that same way, God wants us to know Him personally, experientially, intimately. That's the kind of way that God wants us to know Him today, King's House. Fast forward to the New Testament, John chapter 10, verse 4. You've all heard this, but I just want to point out this word to you again. Jesus is talking and He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Now, the New Testament was written in Greek. It wasn't written in Hebrew like the Old Testament. So this word know in the New Testament in Greek is called gnosko. Different word, but the definition of gnosko is to know personally, to know experientially, and to know intimately. Two different words, two different languages, exact same meaning. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep personally, experientially, intimately, and my sheep know me. The same way that God knows us, He desires for us to know Him that way personally, experientially, intimately. Here's the thoughts I want to point out to you this morning is that fans know about God, but followers, true followers know Him personally, experientially, and they know God in an intimate kind of way. This is what separates fans from followers, the way that they know God. In Luke chapter 7, there's an incredible illustration that, that, that lays out uh, this concept in a very clear way. It's found in Luke chapter 7. Now, Jesus had been invited to a Pharisee's house. His name was Simon. Customary when you go to someone's house, especially when you're a rabbi, a teacher, an honored guest, when you go to someone's house, you're greeted with a kiss. Either a kiss on the cheek, which is just what you do to everybody, or if it's somebody that, that you hold in, in, in high esteem, then you're going to give them a kiss on the hand. Also customary is that uh, you're going to provide water for that person to wash their feet. You're going to send a servant to wash that person's feet. Again, if it's an honored guest, then you are going to wash that person's feet. And another custom is that you're going to anoint their head with oil. It's just something that customary, especially somebody that you are trying to honor and hold in high esteem. Well, Simon didn't do any of those things when Jesus showed up at his house. Not, not one single one. He broke every custom. If you were to come to my house and I didn't answer the door for you, if I didn't say hi to you, if I didn't shake your hand, if I didn't say, hey, come on on, sit down. Imagine how incredibly rude that would be if I invited you to my house and just completely ignored you. Well, that's exactly what Simon did to Jesus. I want you to see the irony in this moment because Simon was a Pharisee. He had studied the scripture his whole life. Think about this for a second. By the time Simon was 15 years old, he had memorized the Old Testament. You heard me right, King's House. Memorized the Old Testament. Wrap your mind around that feat to memorize the Old Testament. He had memorized over 300 prophecies that point to the Messiah coming to earth. He knew all those things, 300 prophecies. He memorized about the Messiah coming to earth. The Messiah is sitting in his living room 
the person that he had studied his whole life about and memorized all those problems, that person is in his house. And yet he doesn't even recognize him. He knew all about the Messiah, but he didn't know him. Now here comes this woman, and Luke 7 describes her as a sinful woman. This word translated probably means she's a prostitute. She sold her body for profit. Here comes this prostitute. She, uh, she comes to Jesus and she just begins to kiss all over his feet. Now Simon wouldn't even kiss his cheek, but this woman is kissing all over his, not just his cheek, kissing all over his feet. Simon didn't give Jesus water to wash his feet, but this woman is washing his feet with her tears and is drying his feet with her hair. Simon didn't anoint Jesus' head with oil, didn't give him any type of perfume, but this woman came in with an alabaster jar worth over a year's wages. And the word says that she broke it and poured it all over the feet of Jesus. This is the sharp contrast we see between these two individuals. This woman was judged. This woman was criticized. Those Pharisees said, if Jesus knew who and what manner of woman this was, he wouldn't let her put those dirty, stinky hands all over him. What is Jesus doing? She was judged. She was criticized, but she didn't care. She had experienced Jesus. She had experienced him. She knew him on some type of personal level. She had been touched by him in an intimate way. She had experienced a love that maybe she had never experienced before. This woman was fully known. She knew that Jesus knew, like, I'm a prostitute, fully known. But yet she was fully and completely loved. She had never experienced anything like this before. I think it's safe to say Hey, the difference between a fan and a follower, this woman is ready to follow Jesus. Jesus, I'm giving you everything I have. I'm pushing past every bit of criticism. I'm giving you a year's wages. Jesus, I am trusting you with my past. I am trusting you with my present. I am trusting you with my future. This is the difference between a fan and a follower. Simon knew Jesus with his head but did not know Jesus with his heart. Knew all about him, but this woman, Jesus had her heart. She was a follower of Jesus. I wonder when the last time one of us, King's House, I wonder when the last time one of us, uh, when was it last that you were just completely undone by God? When was the last time that you were just so captivated, so mesmerized by his love, by his goodness, uh, by his beauty, that you were just completely undone, that you, you didn't care who was around, you didn't care what people said, you didn't care who saw, you didn't care, when you, were, you were just broken and you just poured out your love and your worship and your praise. When was the last time that you had that type of experience with Jesus? Have you, have you ever had that type of experience with Jesus? There is a horrifying verse in Matthew chapter 7. To me, it's far and away the most terrifying verse in the entirety of Scripture. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Verse 22, Many will say to me on that day, Many, not one, not two, not a couple, not a few, many, that word terrifies me. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Lord, did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not perform miracles in your name? This concerns me. Because we're not talking about, these people didn't say like, God, didn't we just, God, did we not show up to church once a week? Uh, once a month even? God, did we not pay our tithes? Did we not send our kids to Christian schools? Like, these are normal things. But this is not normal stuff these people are talking about. God, did we not prophesy in your name? God, did we not cast out demons? God, did we not do miracles? I mean, to me, this is like, these people are doing the stuff. If anybody was a Christian, if anybody was a follower, surely it would be one of these guys. Then Jesus goes on and says, then I will explain to them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And that word, knew you, in this passage, is the same word that's knew you in the, in, in the passage in John 10, gnosko. I never knew you personally, 
I never knew you experientially, and I never knew you intimately. Man, forget the prophecy. Forget the casting out the demons. Forget the miracles. There's power in the name of Jesus. I need you to ask yourself a question this morning, King's House. Do you know him personally? Have you experienced him? Do you know him in an intimate way today? Friends, do you know him? Do you speak with him? The real question is, is does he speak back to you? Do you experience his presence? Do you experience his love in a life-changing way? Has, have you been changed by those things? Are you being continually changed by those things? If you've experienced Jesus, then let me tell you, guarantee is you can't get enough of it. There, there's nothing like it. So do you have this hunger? Do you have this desire on the inside of you? It's a, it's a, it's a massive concern for me today, King's House. And again, I, I want you to know I'm wearing my boots this morning and I'm trying to step on your toes a little bit. I'm trying to have you ask yourself some very real and some very hard questions. But the reality is, is that our churches are full of people every single Sunday who do not know God. And if you do not know God, it doesn't matter what you know about Him. It doesn't matter what you say about Him. It doesn't matter all the good deeds in the world that you can do for Him. If you don't know Him, you are not ready to stand before Him. You are not ready to spend eternity in heaven for Him. It terrifies me, King's House. It terrifies me. It really does. I want you to think this morning about the, the Apostle Paul. He knew the value of knowing Jesus. Keep in mind that, that, that from the very beginning, he had had an experience with the glory of God. He was knocked off of a horse by the glory of God. The light of heaven had knocked him, off, knocked him on the ground, had blinded him. After he became a, a convert, uh, at some point in that, in that time span, he had such an incredible experience with God that he got taken up to the third heaven. Paul said, in the body, out of the body, I don't know, but what I do know is that I saw and experienced things that I literally can't describe. I mean, this guy experienced God in incredible ways. He went all over the known world, probably the greatest evangelist of all time, wrote the majority of the New Testament. He was shipwrecked, he was snake bit, he was stoned, he was flogged. There's nothing this man didn't experience. It's safe to say like he knew God in an incredible, in a remarkable kind of way. But at the end of his life, this is what's still on the heart of Paul, and I just want to share it with you today. It's in Philippians 3, verses 7 through 10. Listen to these words. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Everything else in comparison to knowing Christ is a loss. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. This is his heart cry at the end of a life. After all of those things, this is still what's burning on his heart. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. He had the secret, King's House. Once you experience God, once you know him personally, once you know him intimately, that's all your heart desires. That's all your heart wants. Paul knew Christ. We can all agree on that. But the, thing, the fire is still burning in his heart. God, I want to know you more. God, I want to, to know you even more closely, more intimately. In closing today, King's House, I just really want you to investigate, to ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart, to search your life with this very simple question. Do I know him? Do you know Jesus today? Are you a fan? Do you sit at a distance? Do you cheer? Do you know all about him? Or do you actually know him? Do I know Jesus in a personal, in an experiential, and in an intimate kind of way? Friend, if you don't, please don't wait one more minute to, to, to pray, God, I want to know you. I need you to be my Savior. I want to experience you. I want to know you on a personal level in an intimate kind of way. Listen, this relationship with Jesus is the most important, the most crucial, and the most rewarding relationship you will ever have in your life. Do you know him? 
this morning, King's House. Pray with me if you would. God, I love you so much. God, I thank you for everyone that's tuned in this morning, that's listening, that's watching. Holy Spirit, ask the hard questions to our heart today. Do we know Jesus? It's not enough to know about him. It's not enough to do things for him. It's not enough just to read the word. It's not enough to prophesy, to cast out demons. None of those things are enough. The simple question, do I know Jesus? Keep us awake at night. Wake us up early in the morning. Don't let that question get off of our heart and off of our mind until we're able to answer it honestly. Jesus, I love you today. Thank you for your sacrifice, for your blood, for everything you're doing and going to continue to do. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. King's House, I love you. I sure enough hope that we can have small groups Wednesday night if this weather cooperates. God bless you. Have a great rest of your week.